They look at television, they see these two cars, one black, one white, and they put a gallon of gas in each one. <laughs> see which car can go the farthest. And every time the black car stops first and the white car can keep going. So this brainwashes the Negro, see? Then he goes to the drugstore, he orders two dips ice cream. He says, I want a dip of chocolate, dip of vanilla. And every time they put the chocolate on the bottom and the vanilla on the bottom. When he goes to the grocery store, he goes to get cake. He sees the angel food cake is the white cake, and the devil food cake is the chocolate cake. A man called Cassius Clay and then Muhammad Ali saw the world in black and white. But that's how America was in the turbulent 60s, when he used his mouth and his fists to shake up the world. As Muhammad Ali once said, if you don't have the courage to take risks, you will never accomplish a thing. Ali took those risks, but he accomplished more than any man in the history of boxing. As Cassius Clay, he took on the sports goliath, Sonny Liston, a 7-1 favorite, and proceeded to shock the world. He joined the controversial nation of Islam, refused to fight in Vietnam, and took the United States government to court and won. Ali waged epic battles against some of the greatest heavyweights in history. Joe Frazier, George Foreman, Ken Norton, who prevailed five times. And Sports Illustrated honored him as the athlete of the century. I am the greatest, he would say, of all time. Born in 1942, Cassius Clay grew up in segregated Louisville, Kentucky. He shared his well-kept home with his older brother Rudy, his mother Odessa, and father Cassius Sr. At the age of 12, Cassius took up boxing, and it was all because of a stolen bicycle. Well, I started about six years ago. My bicycle was stolen, and my cousin was a boxer. He wasn't too successful, but he boxed. And he told me that uh, he would train me. If I ever catch the guy that, you know, our kids think, if I ever caught the guy that stole my bicycle, well, he would, uh, I would know how to fight. You know, I could defend myself. Well, uh, anyway, he took me to the gym, and he quit later, but I kept it up. Did you catch the guy who stole your bike? No, I never did. You uh, still looking for him? No, no, not now. I was just a kid then. <laughs> A phenomenal athlete, young Clay concentrated on boxing, where he excelled as an amateur fighter, racking up win after win with his long reach and lightning quick blows. He ran his mouth just as fast, drawing fans by the thousands. Trained by Fred Stoner, he won the Golden Gloves national title in 59, and again a year later. Here he battles Jimmy Jones in the 1960 Western Golden Gloves Championship. The Chicago Tribune said that Clay was as clever as any fighter in the history of the tournament. He won over a hundred Golden Glove fights, losing just six. Flying in an airplane was Cassius Clay's only fear, but he overcame his jitters to fly over to the 1960 Rome Olympics, where he took out Australian Tony Madigan in the light heavyweight semifinals and then won a five to nothing decision over one of the best amateurs in the world, a Polish light heavyweight with over 200 fights to his credit. Cassius Clay, just 18 years old, was an Olympic gold medalist and became the darling of the Olympic village, signing autographs for fans wherever he went and befriending other athletes, including Wilma Rudolph, the three-time gold medalist. Cassius beamed with American and personal pride, wearing his gold medal everywhere, to the cafeteria, to the closing ceremonies, and even on the plane ride home. Trained by the great Angelo Dundee, Clay vowed to win the heavyweight title before his 21st birthday. He began with a win over Tony Hunsaker in 1960, 
and went 16-0 and in his first two years. He outpointed Duke Sabadon in Las Vegas and whipped Billy Daniels on a TKO in New York. Alex Mitiff of Argentina didn't stand a chance. Clay made headlines by calling the round in which each fighter would go down. Archie Moore would fall in four. He did. Charlie Powell wouldn't survive five. He didn't. Clay's biggest test came in March of 63 against top 10 contender Doug Jones. Almost from the start, Jones mounted a two-fisted attack, backing Clay up. Late in the first round, Jones landed an overhand right that sent Clay reeling into the ropes. The young fighter held on to weather the attack. Clay, who had predicted a fourth round knockout, stepped up his attack in the called round, but to no avail. With his prediction unfulfilled, Clay opened round five, dancing and moving behind his jab. It was that lightning left jab that brought Clay back into the fight. Clay's hand speed and combination punching began to turn the tide in his favor. A right hand by Jones in the eighth reminded Clay he was in the fight of his young career. He rallied back with his own flurry of punches and finished the round on even terms. Both men entered the tenth, knowing that the outcome of the fight hung in the balance. Jones was determined, but Clay was quicker and busier over the final three minutes. It was close, but Clay survived to earn a unanimous decision. Those who thought the fight would humble Clay had another thing coming. What's all that noise, Cassius? Hey, how you doing? We just taking it easy before the Henry Cooper annihilation. Listen, now you're like a new Cadillac here and a record player in a Cadillac. You're living like the champion. You're not the champion yet. Well, I'm really the uncrowned champion. Uh, this big bear, Sonny Liston, heard he might fight me, so he went and broke his knee. Listen, Clay, uh, I know for a long time you're going around town really popping off. I want Patterson. I want Patterson. Now Patterson offers you a fight, and uh, you turn him down. You're going to fight some other guy. Shut I don't fight for peanuts. I'm the prettiest thing in the ring today. I'm the prettiest sport. Uh, I have a bodyguard with me. I have, as a matter of fact, I have two bodyguards. My brother, Ronald King, who's known uh, 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 for being one of the biggest players in the country. We don't um, fight for nothing. Claude Patterson needs me. I don't need him. Well, why aren't you going to fight him? He don't want to offer. He don't want to give me 30% of the gate. And if I can't have my cut, then I'm going to fight. Patterson's a dead man. I'm the greatest. They all need me. I know, you, I know you don't want to talk about Jones, but a lot of people are disappointed with your performance against Jones. Well, I heard that big ugly bear, Sonny Listen, was watching the fight down here on the beach. So I didn't want to really, uh, 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 really whoop Jones too bad because Listen is a friend of me. I know it, he know it, but these fans are fools. Listen loses sleep over me. Yeah, but he was happy that you won because I talked to him after the fight. He was very happy. What do you think of that? Yeah, he was happy because he know when he fight me, it'll be the biggest gate in the whole all history. And anyway, I'm tired of talking about fighting. We're sporting now. <laughs> the cocky Clay followed with another tough fight against England's Henry Cooper. Cooper sent Clay to the canvas in the fourth with a resounding left hook, his Henry's hammer. But Clay came back to stop Cooper in the next round, the predicted fifth. It gave you a few seconds extra, a breather, didn't no, it? No, it didn't. No, didn't no, know. they didn't They didn't cut no time, Frank. Neither the knockdown nor the booze from the British crowd affected the young contender. I'm always booed. Everywhere I go, I'm booed. I like to be booed. That's why I fight hard. And you came in the ring with a crown on your head. Is that because uh, I am the king. I understand you have a queen of England, but you don't have a king. Despite close calls against Jones and Cooper, Clay's record now stood at 19-0, and Clay himself stood on the threshold of the heavyweight championship. Lloyd Patterson, humble and conservative, the antithesis of Clay, held the title during the late 1950s. He had lost the belt to Ingemar Johansson in 59, but regained it a year later when he knocked out Ingemar. And then there was Sonny Liston, the big, bad, brutish man who had ripped through the heavyweight division and then captured the heavyweight title by knocking out Patterson in the first round and then repeated the act a year later by KOing him again in the first round. Fighting Liston seemed like suicide, something next to a death wish, but Clay was confident he could beat the man he called the Big Ugly Bear. The fight will not go be This will be the biggest contest in the country. And if you like to lose your mind, be a fool and bet on Sunday. 
big ugly bear. I'm tired of hearing listen. Everywhere I go, they're talking about listen. I got to be with me. You tell this to your camera, your TV man, your radio man, and you right there in the whole world. If Sonny listen with me, I'll kiss his feet in the rain. The confident Clay, from press conference to training, was so pumped up that even during his training, he used the Beatles as barbells, then knocked out the entire Fab Four with one punch. At the weigh-in for the February 64 fight, even Liston nor the press could believe Clay's theatrics, his float like a butterfly, sting like a bee chance. Joe Lewis is flat-footed, and Sonny Liston is flat-footed. Joe Maria and I are too pretty down. We can't be. I'm ready to rumble. Look like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Two things were evident from the start of the fight. Clay's movement would be trouble for the plodding Liston, and at 210 pounds, and 6'3", Clay was every bit if not bigger than Liston. It was a matchup of Clay's speed versus Liston's power, and intimidation was never a factor. Clay brazenly planting his feet and firing away right from round one. In round four, Clay's eyes mysteriously began to sting. It could have been the liniment used on Liston's shoulder, or maybe even a foreign substance put on his gloves. Whatever it was, Clay was flustered, and Liston now had his chance. But once Clay's eyes cleared, and Clay had regained total control of the fight, he began to pick Liston apart. When Liston refused to answer the bell for the seventh round, Cassius Clay was the new heavyweight champion of the world. He had indeed shocked the world. And after the fight, he continued to rant and rave. It was Cassius Clay's world. What you gonna say now, huh? I didn't, he, he can't go one round. He might get him in two. He pulled his hands back. He holds his hands too low. Well, I'm still pulling with witness. Fifth round, I couldn't see. He had liniment in his gloves and liniment all over his head. My whole face was burning. You saw me. I couldn't throw a punch, and I still got away. I whooped him so bad, he had to go to the hospital, and I'm still pretty. What you gonna say about that, huh? The bear couldn't hurt me. The bear couldn't even get a good lick on the pretty. Put him in the hospital. He's never been stopped. He's never been whooped. Oh, I'm so great. Oh, I'm so great. Oh, I shook up. I wouldn't make it so good. All these hypocrites. You can't call it a fix. You can't call it a fix because the, I didn't stop the fight. The doctors had to stop it. Oh, I'm so pretty. I shook up the world. After the fight, Clay dropped a bombshell. He had joined the Nation of Islam, led by Elijah Muhammad. The Nation of Islam, called by journalists black Muslims, rejected racial integration, calling instead for their own black nation separate from the United States. Clay also rejected his slave name, Cassius Clay, insisting he be called Muhammad Ali. Our guest is the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. He is truly a superior fighter. Cassius Clay won the championship by defeating all contenders and then by knocking out Sonny Liston. Cassius Clay has been in the headlines many times and for different reasons. He has just returned from overseas where he visited Egypt, Ghana, Nigeria. He now is known as Muhammad Ali. Are you opposed to integration? Well, yes, ma'am, in a way when it is forced integration, when, it's, when it brings about death of people, especially my people, and people being beat by clubs and pushed and ducked in water and beaches, and people come up disappearing and blow it up in churches, then I don't like that. First, I'm a black man. I'm an Afro-American. See, if a Chinese is born there, he's called a Chinese-American. If an Indian is born there, no, he's called no, Indian. American. he may American. be called an American of Chinese origin. Depends on how you want to put it. Well, I'm not no American. I'm a black man. I, it, I wouldn't want to cheapen myself like that because my country is old. Is a, you can't date the history of my people. And I would be cutting my history off if I just say I'm American first. And that's only 510 years old. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud to say I'm an African. Ali's rejection of white America was reciprocated by the press, many in the mainstream press continuing to call him Cassius Clay. Ali wanted to collar the big ugly bear again, but almost from the start the rematch was beset with problems. First, Ali underwent an emergency hernia operation. 
then former Nation of Islam leader, Malcolm X had been assassinated and hours later, arsonists torched Ali's apartment. But amidst the turmoil, the Liston rematch was moved to a hockey rink in Lewiston, Maine, and it got on. And from the opening bell, it was clear Ali's movement would be a problem to the plotting Liston. Liston tried to hit the champ with left jabs and rights, but he couldn't even get close enough. Then, like a flash, a chopping right hand from Ali dropped Liston. Surprised, incensed, maybe both, Ali stood over Liston, screaming for him to get up, get up, and fight. A phantom punch? Watch it again as Ali's right connects with Liston's jaw and Liston's leg comes off the canvas. By the time referee Jersey Joe Walcott was able to corral Ali, Liston had been down for as long as 20 seconds. As Walcott walked to the ropes to check with the timekeeper, Ali and Liston briefly began fighting again before Jersey Joe finally stopped it. The official time, 1.52 of the first round. How could one single punch drop the mighty bear? Today, it still remains one of boxing's unanswered questions. With the sunny now eclipsed, the number one challenger was Lloyd Patterson, who had recovered from his two Liston defeats to win five straight fights. Ali, intimating Patterson with less fight than run, called him the rabbit. He even showed up at the Patterson training session with rabbit food, carrots and lettuce. A Patterson fight took place in Las Vegas in November 65. Early on, Ali spent more time dancing around, trying to catch the rabbit, and demanding he call him by his name, Muhammad Ali. Patterson was one of the quickest heavyweights in history, but Ali's hand speed was clearly in evidence. And on another level, Patterson was unable to mount any type of attack. Watch how easily Ali scores. Ali turned up the heat in round six, producing the fight's first real exchange. Floyd wilts to the canvas just before the round end. The accuracy and speed of Ali's punches wore down the former champ. The referee finally stopped the fight in round 12. Four months after chasing down the rabbit, Ali faced granite chin George Chavallo, who had never been knocked down. Chavallo absorbed all of Ali's blows, but Ali won on every card. By early 1966, Ali was becoming unpopular amongst mainstream America. Due to his stance against the Vietnam War, he insisted the war was against his religious beliefs. Besides, he said, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. But Ali had become a hero to those of the burgeoning anti-war movement, who began to hit the streets in enormous numbers in the spring of 66. He also inspired millions of increasingly disenchanted African Americans. Young black men were being shipped to the jungles of Vietnam in disproportionate numbers, while blacks were still being denied freedom in America. African Americans like Ali and Stokely Carmichael understood the hypocrisy. Facetiously, Carmichael urged black men, join the army because he said, you can't die fast enough in the ghettos. Denied the right to fight in his home country, Ali took his title to merry old England. His arrival in spring of 66 mirrored the Beatles' invasion of America two years prior. The British press, the fans fawned over Muhammad, the first heavyweight champion to fight in England since 1908. Ali defended his crown against Henry Cooper, who had knocked him down back in 63. A notorious bleeder, Cooper took special vitamins and ointments to toughen his skin, but to no avail. Ali cut Cooper above his left eye, turning his face into a gruesome, bloody mess. Afterward, the champ was subdued. Well, I wasn't really too worried, but I was just cautious and watching his hard left hook, and I'm down, and I feel bad that the fight had to end the way it did with him uh, bleeding so badly, and it's taken me a while to get over it because it was an awful sight. Did he cut you with one or two that hurt you? Well, one or two, but not really nothing serious. Are you planning on a return? Uh, no, no. There won't be a return. What will be your next fight, you know? Well, uh, we don't exactly know now who we're fighting next. We're just resting now. But uh, I just hate the, the fight ended the way it did with him uh, cut like that. I hate to see blood, and I don't like to see people hurt so bad. And it just weakened me, and I just couldn't stand the punch after I saw him bleed. And I just had to stay off of him and wait for the referee to stop it. But I think the referee should have stopped it uh, bef the minute he was cut because it was that bad.
Despite asserting he would never return to England, Ali flew back to London weeks later for yet another title defense. While back home, Americans endured a long, hot summer in 66. Their sons were dying by the thousands in Vietnam, while angry students burned draft cards in protest. But Muhammad took solace in the quiet of an English gym. Here he could escape the chaos as he prepared for a bout against Brian London in London. The challenger didn't have a chance, falling to a right cross in the third round. In September of 66, Ali traveled to Germany where he pummeled European champion Karl Mildenberger for 12 rounds. Up next for Ali was hard-hitting veteran Cleveland Big Cat Williams. The fight took place indoors at the Houston Astrodome. Angie Dundee said Ali was at his peak for this fight. It's not difficult to see why. Ali opened the fight, gliding across the ring with footwork unparalleled by any heavyweight in history. And the jab? It was Cobra-like. Williams had no defense. In round two, a short right dropped Williams to the canvas. Ali followed with a barrage of punches that sent Williams down again. Williams rose to his feet, determined to fight on. Ali settled in and planted his feet and unleashed a powerful three-punch volley. This was also the fight in which Ali introduced the Ali Shuffle. Watch that footwork. Yet another short right hand puts Williams down again. A battered and bloody Williams was defenseless on the ropes until referee Harry Kessler called an end to the fight in round three. In February of 67, Ali prepared to fight Ernie Terrell. At 6'6", with a powerful left jab, Terrell was thought to be Muhammad's toughest opponent since Sonny Liston. Ali analyzed the upcoming bout in verse. He's going around claiming to be the real heavyweight champ. But after I'm finished, he'll just be a tramp. Now, I'm not saying this just to be funny, but I'm fighting Ernie because he needs the money. The Ali who stepped into the ring that night to fight Ernie Terrell was at his physical peak as a fighter. Bent on destruction, Ali opened the fight with a quick flurry. The fight was personal to Ali. He set out to humiliate Terrell because the challenger referred to him as Cassius Clay. And that, Ali said, was his slave name. Late in the second round, a looping right hand stunned Terrell. Ali then capitalized on his advantage by unloading a barrage of punches. Terrell had extremely long arms, leading Ali to call him the Octopus. And some believe that his advantage in reach gave him a chance to outbox Muhammad. But Terrell was hindered by a badly swollen eye. He fought gamely on as the rounds rolled violently by. Ali's disdain for his opponent was obvious throughout the fight. He taunted Terrell, defiantly shouting at him, what's my name, what's my name, as Terrell looked on helplessly. Ali would start the 15th round the same he started the first, throwing combinations. Ali's attack on Terrell was pure punishment. He won the fight by a unanimous decision, but his own image took a hit because it was felt Ali purposely sought to humiliate a battered opponent. Ali would fight just once more in the 60s, facing 34-year-old Zora Foley. Ali knocked him out in the seventh round. Now 29-0, he had made nine straight title defenses. With the war escalating in Vietnam, Ali found himself classified 1A, the highest priority to be drafted. He appealed the decision, claiming he was a conscientious objector as a minister of Islam. The appeal was denied, and on April 28, 1967, Ali was required to report to the Army Induction Center in Houston. There, he refused to step forward and be sworn in. Houston, Texas. Eight o'clock Friday morning. Enter Clay with bodyguard. To him, larger bodyguard of cameramen and reporters. Good morning, champ. How's it going to go this morning? Champion. Hey, man. Have you changed any of your thinking? Hey, hey, hey. Have you changed any of your thinking? Still going to not take the step. No comments. No comments? No comments. Your action will be registered in a matter of two or three hours from now. Still no comments. You are registered here right now. But you know that you're not going to take the step. Is that not true? No comments. 
Why have you suddenly right. turned brand new into me? Clay's first taste of military life, and quite possibly his only one, was at the induction or call-up centre at the old post office building in Houston. Just before lunch, it's all over. But Clay is not telling what happened in the private ceremony where one pace forward would have meant acceptance of the call-up. From Clay himself, nothing. The man they used to call the Louisville Lip and cast the gas had forsworn speech for the time being. Are you going to resume your boxing career? Are you talking to us, champ? All I have here is a... Uh... Uh, statements that I have prepared. Statements that I have prepared. Answer all of your questions on future fights. Uh, Come on, Eddie. The future period. Anything you can think of. Uh, I have the statements, and I have them to be released now. Could you state briefly why you declined? No, I will not say nothing. It's all in here. The statement said that Clay would have been untrue to his religion if he'd accepted the draft. Clay and his advisers were more anxious that they should be recognized as a proper church whose ministers were on a level with other ministers. In short, Clay can keep the fight going, and he has a fund of sympathy among his own people. He has less among whites who see no parallel with the system of deferments for educational or professional reasons as it's used at other social levels. But Negroes in Houston are for him. More questionable is the role of the black Muslims in all this. It's alleged, for example, that they've taken such large sums off him that he's actually had to borrow money from them to pay alimony to his divorced wife. Clay now faces a nomadic existence of uncertain duration divided between courthouses and meeting houses all over America. His occupation's gone. He seems unlikely to box again for a long time. Patriots deride him. The Peace Party applaud him. His black Muslim friends keep him from faltering. It's doubtful whether he has the intellectual equipment to evaluate these pressures. But under them all, he keeps a dignity and repose which make it difficult to maintain that he's either cowardly or dishonest. By refusing induction, Ali was stripped of his title. On June 19th, he was sentenced to five years in prison. His lawyers appealed, and for four years, his case languished in the courts. Muhammad would be cleared to fight in 1970, and in 1971, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned his conviction. Ali was a free man at last. His comeback fight would come in October 1970 against Jerry Quarry in Atlanta, Georgia. The handsome Irish American was quick and hard hitting and could absorb punches. But Ali's biggest opponent was Georgia Governor Lester Maddox. The racist segregationist did not want a draft dodging black man boxing in his state. But although Maddox called the fight a day of mourning, the show would go on. Ali's cornerman, Bundini Brown, said the former champ had much to prove. His mission is to come back and beat everybody and prove to the world he's the greatest ever lived. The fastest heavyweight was ever been in the ring. For the first time since March 1967, Muhammad Ali climbed into the ring for a professional prize fight. Ali wasted no time in showing Quarry and the crowd that this comeback was for real. The movement was there, and so was his trademark hand speed. The aggressive Quarry was a legitimate contender and perhaps too much a task for Ali's first fight back. Quarry's left hooks posed a constant danger, but Ali was not going to be denied. His left jab still remained the key to his success. It was this onslaught of punches that produced a cut above Quarry's left eye. With the blood flowing, Quarry still fought on. Quarry, the fighting Irishman, still wanted to continue, but his corner stopped the fight between the third and fourth rounds. After three and a half years, Ali hadn't missed a beat, and his face was still pretty. After the quarry fight, Ali took time to rhyme about Oscar Bonavena. You know, I got a few things. I tell him when I'm whooping him. <laughs> and then after I'm whooping him and talking to him, um, about the eighth round, tag him again, let him know he's got one more round to go. <laughs> then... In the ninth round, he shall be mine in round nine. <laughs> and if he don't go in nine, I'm going to tell him at the end of the round, you're a bad man. <laughs> Ali knocked him out, 
but not until round 15. Late 1970, Smokin' Joe Frazier agreed to fight the Louisville Lip. This is the fight fans had been waiting for, the most anticipated heavyweight bout since Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling in 1938. For the first time, an undefeated former heavyweight champion fought an undefeated champion. Ali was 31-0 with 25 knockouts, and Frazier was 26-0 with 23 knockouts. Ali did whatever he could to hype the fight. He wrote down the round in which Frazier would fall, sealed it in an envelope, and promised his prediction would be read moments before the fight. Amid the media circus, a reporter questioned Ali's arrogance. I got a question to ask you to get you going. We, we went to a psychiatrist who studied you, psychologist. He says you're a great showman, but he says inside, actually, the reason, one of the main reasons that you are constantly, you know, aware of the fact that you are, have great confidence saying that you're going to win is because you're trying to instill in yourself the confidence that you can win. Do you follow what you I say? And what do you that I must be an expert because everything that I've said for the past 10 years has come true. And I don't think it's luck or it's just trying to build up confidence within myself. And if it is, then I would say I'm more of a, a prophet than he is. So you're not trying to psych yourself? Psych myself. I'm the best fighter to ever live. Can't you see my face? Do you see any scratches? I'm not talking. I've been in this game 18 years, fella. Two-time United States Golden Club champion. Tell that psychiatrist. I'm two-time national AAU champion, world Olympic gold medal winner, 12 world heavyweight title fights. Tell him I was off for four years and had a six-week notice and came back and defeated Jerry Quarry and Oscar Bonavino quicker, quicker and easier than Joe Frazier without a scratch. He said all that hollering is because you are inadequate. He inadequate. Says, you have inadequacy. Well, well you tell says, him to go get all of my films and watch and see that I do just what I hollered I would do. Not surprisingly, Ali wrote a poem about the upcoming fight. What's going to happen when you meet Smokin' Joe? And I said, Joe's going to come out smoking, and I ain't going to be joking. I'll be pecking and a poking, pouring water on his smoking. And then this might shock and amaze you, but I will destroy Joe Frazier. Some people say, you better watch Joe Frazier. He's awful strong. I said, tell him to try band roll on. On March 8th, 1971, the stars of New York came out to see the fight of the century. Ali left his dancing shoes at home and instead traded bombs with the powerful champion. Fraser was relentless, especially with his left. At one point, he even taunted Ali. Fraser's punishing body blows wore down Muhammad. Ali showed tremendous stamina, rallying in the ninth round. But Fraser kept coming, staggering Ali in the 11th with a pair of brutal lefts. And in the 15th, he sent Ali to the floor for the only knockdown of the fight. Fraser was tired, his eyes were closing, but he went the distance and won by a unanimous decision. 300 million people watched Fraser win the fight and retain his title, but Ali vowed there would be a rematch. Ali quickly returned to the ring, taking on his former sparring partner, Jimmy Ellis. He left Ellis dazed and confused and unable to go the distance. Ali trained hard for his next fight against Buster Mathis, who had gone 11 tough rounds against Joe Frazier before being stopped. Muhammad equated the bout to the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This will be Buster's last thing. I will do the Buster what the Indians did to Custer. I'm gonna wipe him out. And right there on England, everybody out there in England, get to your television sets because I have thousands of fans over there in London and I'm gonna wipe him out. I'm gonna wipe out Joe Frazier. I had a good reception there in Manchester, Birmingham, and London. And I'm gonna prove that I am still the real champion. And I want them all to tune in to watch Buster linger on. <laughs> I said he will linger on. <laughs> he will linger on. Mathis lingered for 11 rounds, hitting the canvas four times. Ali would not get another chance at the championship for three years. From 71 to 74, he traveled the world fighting fights in Switzerland, Canada, Ireland, Japan, and Indonesia. He even staged an exhibition in front of the Crown Prince of Morocco. During that time, Ali took on 13 opponents, defeating 12. 
His barrage of punches dashed the dreams of the great white hope, Jerry Quarry again. Ali battled a cold in Dublin, but had enough strength to defeat Al Blue Lewis. He revisited Floyd Patterson, whose career he ended with a seventh round TKO. He knocked down light heavyweight champ Bob Foster eight times and beat Joe Bugner. In March of 73, Ali zeroed in on a much tougher challenger, former Marine Ken Norton. The muscle-bound contender broke Ali's jaw in the first round, valiantly. Ali went the distance, but Norton prevailed in a split decision. Ali's jaw healed, and a rematch was scheduled for October. The champ took the early rounds with punches like this one. But Ali injured his hand and had to hold on for a close split decision. With his loss to Norton now avenged, Ali trained in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania, preparing for his long-awaited rematch with Joe Frazier. Joe was no longer the heavyweight champ, having been knocked down six times by George Foreman. But for a non-championship fight, none has ever been bigger than Ali Frazier II in January 74. Both fighters went after each other during an interview on ABC, and Ali verbally attacked Frazier leading up to the fight. Like George Foreman, who came fighting, it came through a left jail. Just, it's a terrible. <laughs> Don't believe it? Go get the films. I'll go show them to you now. And listen, and Joe Bugner couldn't do nothing to him. Bugner had him rocking a couple of times. Joe Frazier's in trouble. Because the Muhammad Ali Joe Frazier's going to meet is going to be better than the Muhammad Ali he met three years ago. Throughout the fight, Frazier struggled to deliver that big blow. Ali landed more punches using jabs and a chopping right hand. And in the end, Ali won a close but clear unanimous decision. With Joe Frazier finally conquered, Ali traveled to Zaire for the rumble in the jungle to fight the reigning world champion George Foreman, the powerful slugger who had defeated Joe Frazier in 73 to capture the title. Foreman had demolished Frazier, knocking him down six times. Ali and Foreman had spent the summer of 74 training in Zaire. Ali felt inspired in the land of his people, and he won over fans by the thousands. Ali, boom Ali, kill him, they cried. Though the fight was scheduled for September 25th, it was postponed five weeks due to an injury suffered by Foreman. During that time, the president of Zaire did not allow the boxers to leave the country, fearing they would never return for the bout. Ali became increasingly hyped for the fight, railing, railing against Foreman. I just want to see him that day in the arena because that's one place he won't be able to duck. The vibrations are against him, the planets are against him, and already he right. lost the first five rounds. <laughs> right. Is that right? That's are we right. going to days? Float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Uh, rumble, young man, rumble. Because when I whoop this man, I want to be declared by all as the greatest of all time. That's right. Because the stage is set. I'm 32 years old. My legs are gold. This man is strong. We <laughs> talked about how great he was. And now we're going to see. Get them all out at your theaters. And you write everything you write. But I'm going to make you eat everything you say against me. All of my critics. I don't prove to the world that I'm still the fastest, the prettiest, the most classic, the most scientific, the greatest fighter of all. All the time. That's right. This fight, right? That's right. Is that right? That's right. That's right? This fight will make me the greatest fighter of all times. Now you have anything else to say? The fight was scheduled for four in the morning to accommodate American TV viewers. And after the weigh-in, Ali ran out of the stadium in his robe, his fans following in an almost surreal display. Though a five to one underdog, Ali was ready to rumble. Finally, it was time for the fight. The world was watching, and Zaire was put on the map. Ali made the first statement of the fight, firing this right hand. He was not going to be intimidated by the powerful young champion. Foreman knew just one way to fight, straight ahead, walking in, launching bombs. Foreman's body attack was vicious, but it didn't stop Ali from countering. It was clear that by round three, Ali's plan was to counter off the ropes with the rope a Fighting off the ropes certainly had its consequences, and so did Ali's counters, which began to stun Foreman. The rope a strategy was a simple one. Sit back and let Foreman punch himself out. Ali's tactics began to frustrate Foreman, whose punches became wild and desperate. As Ali conserved energy, Foreman continued to pound away. Suddenly, Ali would burst off the ropes with a volley of punches. By round eight, Foreman was exhausted. One final flurry and Muhammad Ali was once again heavyweight champion of the world. 
Having beaten Foreman and Frazier, Allie proposed a greater challenge. Joe Frazier and George Foreman in one night to solve all this stuff about who's the greatest. <laughs> I beat Foreman, he's got excuses. The cow was too slow, the rain was soft, and, and the canvas was all this stuff. And, and ropes are loose, and Frazier's talking about he's got a new punch now, and he's ready, and he beat me twice, but I barely won or whatever. I'm going to beat both of them in one night. So I said, American officials won't probably promote this. They say it ain't serious against the law. So I'll take it to Russia or China, two communist countries of, of, of uh, professed interest in taking the fight. I got a call from Estonia and Russia the other day. Can't say who or where, but if they said, they said if we can get the promoters, put the money up, they'll sanctionize me and uh, Frazier and Fullman. I want Frazier first for 10 rounds. And after I whoop Joe Frazier, I want George Fullman for 10 rounds. And I guarantee that I'll whoop them both. And after I whoop Frazier, whether it's a third round knockout, whether it's a decision or what, I don't want one minute of rest. I want George Fullman to jump right in the ring. And I make this statement to the whole world, all people watching this interview, I'm seriously trying to get Joe Frazier and George Foreman in one night and to go down as the greatest fight of all time. Some of them still have doubt. They're making excuses. I want to whoop both of these men in one night and I'll have a record that nobody can touch. Ali would never again face George Foreman and the third Ali Frazier fight wouldn't be for another year. In the meantime, he took on three lesser fighters in 75, beginning with 36-year-old long shot Chuck Wepner, the inspiration for Sylvester Stallone's Rocky Balboa. How are you going to whip Muhammad Ali? There's no secret weapon. I intend to uh, come out smoking, as Joe Fraser might say. I'll be putting the pressure on him all the way. I don't think the guy can go 15 rounds anymore. I think his legs are shot. And if I keep the pressure on him, he'll be laying on a rope like he did with Foreman. And if he lays on a rope like he did with Foreman, I'll lead him up because that's where I like to fight. So that's, that's the strategy, nothing spectacular. I'm just going to keep the pressure on him, and when he stops moving, we're going we're gonna to hit him and we're going to take him out. Although knocked down momentarily by Wepner, unlike Rocky, Wepner couldn't go the distance falling in the 15th round. Ron Lyle gave the champ a battle for 10 rounds, but Ali unloaded a barrage of punches to put him away. And Joe Bugner, whom Ali had whipped two years earlier, fought the champ again this time in Malaysia. Ali dominated him for 15 rounds for the fourth straight title defense. October of 75, the Philippines hosted the fight everyone had been waiting for. Ali Fraser III for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. It was called the Thriller in Manila and Ali was in his finest form. I have two punches, one called the balloon punch and one called the needle. This left jab is the balloon. It swells your head up and this is going to pop it. <laughs> it will be a killer and a chiller and a thriller when I get the gorilla in Manila. All his hair will do all night. That's all he's going to do. Is that why you picked no, no, Manila? No. That's all he's going to do all night. That's all you're going to see me do to Joe Frazier's head all night. I'm going to stop all these people talking about Joe Frazier. Ali's antics infuriated Fraser, and he didn't let up. My lawyers told me to bring a bail bondsman to get me out of jail. They might put my tail in jail and get me out on bail after what I do to Joe Fraser. I'm gonna do something to Joe Fraser. This will be such a good whooping, such a dynamic beat, such a superior whooping. I'm gonna jab him. I'm gonna box him. I'm gonna hit him with left hooks, uppercuts, just like you in training. I'm greater than the sparring partners. They punch him around daily. He's gonna be ooh, ooh, straining and missing, and I'm gonna be playing with it for two or three rounds, sticking him and sticking him. Use that long left jab, sticking him, sticking him, left, right, left, hook, ducking. He'll be ducking all into my punches, and I'm just gonna dance. Move, and in my glory, I'm going to yeah, be in my yeah, glory, yeah, open Joe Frazier, yeah, and then I'm going to stick him, and he's yeah, going to fall. Yeah, yeah. Ali's energy would finally dissipate on the day of the fight. Searing heat, a packed arena, a tin roof, and hot lights turned the arena into a sauna. Ali and Fraser were about to endure 14 rounds of pure hell. The fight was a war from the start, which is always the way it was when Ali and Fraser squared off. Ali was convinced Frazier was shot, and he spent the early rounds trying to figure his rival out. Ali even resorted to a little rope-a-dope, and Frazier was only too happy to oblige, ripping hooks into a stationary target. And when he got bored, Ali opened up with combinations, 
violently swinging the momentum back in his favor. But Fraser never stopped moving forward, and by round five, he had hammered his way back into the fight. Alley may have been 33 and Fraser 31, but the fight's pace and the intensity belied the ages of both. Fraser did his best work when Ali paused along the ropes, digging hooks to the body. A right cross sent Fraser's mouthpiece flying, and one more time, Ali regained control. The onslaught continued into round 14, and Fraser's face was now a swollen mask of pain. Trainer Eddie Crutch stopped it, saying to Fraser, no one will ever forget what you have done here today. He was half right, and no one will ever forget what Fraser and Ali had done. The Thriller in Manila would be the last great fight of Ali's career. When America turned 200 in 1976, Ali turned 34, and his legendary quickness had faded into memory. When he defeated lightly regarded Jimmy Young, he looked slow and out of shape. Even his shtick had grown tired. His threats against challenger Richard Dunn seemed more staged than ever. In 1976, Ali released his autobiography, a book in which he sounded philosophical and astronomical. That's a good question. Uh, I am a deep thinker, but I don't think deep at various press conferences promoting fights. You have to think small in order to reach the average people. So I gave the people what they wanted. This is no jive. He shall fall in five. He will fall in five. If he don't fall, I'll leave the country. They buy tickets and line up for miles. Is he going to fall in five? <laughs> well, he, see, man desires to understand that which he cannot understand. First, he wanted to know what was on the moon. He spent 10, 15 billion dollars for two rocks. Now, he don't want to know what's on the moon no more. Now he want to know what's on Mars. That September, Ali went to Yankee Stadium for the conclusion of his trilogy against Ken Norton. Ali had trashed Norton for appearing in the risque R-rated film called Mandingo. But Norton was all man in this 15-round slugfest. Ali rallied to win the fight, but it was a hotly contested split decision. Critics also split over a movie about Ali's life, starring Ali himself and Ernest Borgnine as Angelo Dundee. Still others questioned whether he should climb into the ring with the menacing Ernie Shavers, but Ali avoided the knockout punch of Shavers and survived a 15-round scare. Ali continued to press his luck, fighting Olympic champ Leon Spinks in February of 78. Ali, who had called Spinks a tough son of a bitch, lost a split decision. Ali sought redemption in their September rematch and prevailed with a unanimous decision, thus becoming the first three-time heavyweight champion. Certainly it was time for Ali to retire, but money and the spotlight lured him back. In 1980, he took on undefeated Larry Holmes, and the result wasn't pretty. Holmes won every single round before the fight was stopped in round 10. Ali blamed his sluggish performance on weight loss medication and vowed to fight again. More troubling, however, was the fact that he began to show signs of illness. Ali had trouble speaking, as evidenced by his trip to England in December of 1980. Mohammed, the $64 question, are you gonna box again? I shall return. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think of the I shall return. Ali did return for one more fight, losing to Trevor Burbick in 1981. Father time has caught up with me, he said after that bout. I'm finished. But something extraordinary had happened after Ali's retirement. While his health deteriorated due to Parkinson's syndrome, his mass appeal continued to increase. He signed his autograph for the Pope, he dined with the President, and he walked with the Dalai Lama. His appearance at the 96 Olympics thrilled the world, and in 2005, he was honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. People around the globe recognized Ali as the ultimate champion, 
not just in the ring, but as a champion of peace, a champion of love, a champion of self-expression, and a champion of self-respect. Ali's battle with Parkinson's did not stop him from traveling abroad on humanitarian missions. He toured the communist countries of Cuba and Vietnam and such troubled nations as Iraq and Afghanistan. His voice was just a whisper, but he communicated with smiles and waves, kisses and hugs. You can see I love the people and the people love me. Mommy, Before you want hair. Ali seemed to have a special bond with those in poorer countries. He gave people hope that they too can be just like him, a kid who overcame the odds to become, as he had promised, the greatest. I'm the prettiest fighter in the ring today. That's my label. Being the world's greatest fighter, how do you manage to stay so pretty? <laughs> well, he who hits and runs away lives to fight another day. <laughs> He's dying to get in the ring with me again. Well, he'll get his chance. He'll be dying to get out of the ring with me, too. No, I believe I stick to boxing. When you look at television, you see white owl cigars, white swan soap, king white soap, white rain hair rim, white tornado flow wax, white plus toothpaste. He, he go, uh, he, he, they taught him when he was a little boy that Mary had a little lamb and speed is white as snow. <laughs> then they taught him about Snow White. <laughs> then there's the White House. <laughs> No special training, just here to fight. I'm ready to back up everything I'm saying, and I'm through talking.